Welcome to a Break in the Action podcast. Here we'll take a break from the tactical and spend our time on the traditional, the Break Action Double Barreled Shotgun. Join us each week for discussion and interviews centered around vintage and modern shotguns, outdoor pursuits, and sporting literature. So sit back and relax as we take a break in the action. Here's your host, shotgun collector, wing shooter, and sporting clays enthusiast, Ryan Dowdy. On April 19, 1775, there was the shot heard round the world. On December 1, 2018, there was Tyson Fury versus Deontay Wilder, followed by the decisive rematch on February 22, 2020. And on February 14, 2021, there was this. And we're going to look at why we make best guns and America just makes guns. Each of these events sent shockwaves far and wide. There have been those who have passionately argued for both sides. Winners have been declared, but questions remain. Today we have two heavyweights on the show, the now infamous Englishman Johnny Carter and America's most trusted voice on all things double barrels, Greg Elliott. We're going to dig in a bit into Johnny's video and see where points can be debated and where common ground can be found. Before we get started, let's back up. One of my all-time favorite ways to kill time is with long-format shotgun hunting and shooting videos on YouTube. Of all the channels I've subscribed to, none gets more of my time and none do I enjoy more than TGS Outdoors. Johnny Carter is the fresh young host who shares his deep knowledge of all things shotguns in an entertaining and personable way. He has hands-on experience with better and best guns from all over the world. Recently, he uploaded a video simply titled, British Guns Are Better Than American Guns, and with that, Pandora's box was opened. I spoke to Johnny after the video was published, and he laughed and agreed that he might have touched a nerve. While he only delivers his opinions in the video, all of which are based on good facts, one thing that I thought might be missing from the discussion is that granted, We produce many times the quantities of guns here in the States, and to be fair, most are mass-produced, purpose-built, and with a very close eye on economy. But what about comparing a best British shotgun to a comparable best American shotgun? A best Parker or a Fox to a best Wesley Richards? Or a best Lefevre or Elsie Smith to maybe a best Holland or Purdy or Boss? Eliminating all of the budget-conscious chaff and simply comparing bests. I, for one, thought this would be a great discussion, but knowing the limits of my knowledge of anything best, I knew I needed to recruit some Yankee help. Re-enter Greg Elliott. Greg's site, Dogs and Doubles, should be a regular visit for you. He's been on the show before, as well as all of your other favorite podcasts. Greg's the only guy that I know of who's handled a Parker Invincible, actually all three, not to mention droves of graded Fox shotguns, L.C. Smiths, and Lefevers. His knowledge also isn't just limited to domestic guns. Greg has experience and knowledge of the great English, British, and Continental shotguns as well. He's the most knowledgeable guy I know stateside on doubles, and I knew he needed to be part of this conversation. So, the stage is set. Gentlemen, welcome to the show. Guys, welcome. I think this is going to be a good discussion. Yeah, thanks for having me. So on the heels of the now viral YouTube video, sorry, yeah, and so that we can start relatively close to the beginning and for the benefit of some listeners who might not know, the hammerless shotgun designs that we know and shoot today were basically perfected 120 to 130 years ago by the English specifically and slightly more broadly, the British, right? Mm -hmm. Obviously. Okay. So since we all agree with that. How would each of you describe a best gun? Greg, I'll let you take this one away. You want me to go first? Okay. So, well, for me, so a best gun, so the way I see best guns are sort of, there's two different ways. I think there are a lot of the British makers. So most of the British makers offered uh, a variety of guns and most of them, uh, so say like a breaker like Holland and Holland, they offered a variety of grades 
and they had a grade that they considered to be their best. Arguably, you know, it was the Royal. And but they did they had a model deluxe, which was basically a Royal, same as a Royal with a little finer engraving. But that was their best gun. Wesley Richards had the same thing. They had a gun that they considered to be the best. They had like a drop lock that they considered to be their best gun. So a lot of times, for, for me, when I think about it, there's two, there's two ways to define it. One is the best gun was the finest gun that um, some makers offered. And then there's also, in my mind, there is the best ways to make a gun. So I have two ways of thinking about it. Just because a maker considered a certain gun to be their best gun doesn't mean I think it's a, a true best gun. So, I mean, all I've done is just really complicate things for everybody. So oh. instead of coming up with an easy answer, I've just split it into two categories and made it I mean, being more of a pain. Uh, so, so maybe here's a follow-up question. Does a best gun have to come from a best maker? Um, in other words, um, does it have to come from a, from a, a, a gun manufacturer with that provenance of of being a best maker, or can can just any old random shop put out just a perfect example shotgun finished um, perfectly and designed perfectly, and that be considered a best gun? Well, I for me, there's so I would say anyone can build a gun that I would consider to be a best gun as long as it had in my mind. It checked all the boxes. But I think if you're talking about traditionally, I mean, Johnny could speak to this more. I don't know that in uh, British culture, they considered, uh, you know, I've always associated like a, the true best with the ones that came out of London. Now, there, there are makers that weren't in London. They weren't in Birmingham. EC Green was a maker that made very, very fine guns. He made some pinless side locks that are fantastic, very high quality, truly a best quality gun. But I don't know that they were thought of as on par with Purdy's and Bosses uh, in their day. That's not – I don't really – you know, because I didn't – I think there's a there's a social cultural aspect to best uh, that also comes into play. So. Okay. Johnny, what do you think? Well, it's really not an easy question because as far as I've ever heard, and I've spoken to a lot of people, there isn't a solid answer. Uh, somebody I respect a lot – said that it is a gun made without compromise. However, if that is the case, then the word best gun doesn't have place with those guns today because I think there's a lot of compromise made to honour tradition. Uh, the word best in the dictionary, is obviously the best way to look at it, is of the most excellent or desirable type or quality. And I think that probably sums up best gun the most. It needs to be excellent, most excellent, and utterly desirable. I think when you're talking about provincial makers, there are a couple of provincial makers who make it, but I think the cost to make a best gun, certainly back in the day, was it just put the provincial makers in too high a price bracket. It would be a bit like buying a, I'm trying to think of a good analogy here, a, a $5,000 yield is. Nobody would do it because you just go, well, for $5,000, I'll just go and buy a Beretta, and that is better. Um, that, that's my thoughts on it anyway. London best is... Those two words do belong together, generally speaking. Okay. So how much are we talking about adornment or em embellishment um, when we're talking about the category of best gun? Does it have to have thirty or forty or fifty thousand dollars worth of engraving on it to be a best gun? Or is it is it primarily the um the design, the execution, um, the the finish, the balance um that is that is playing into that best gun description surely certainly to be desirable it needs to be beautiful i think those those two things have to go together in my head i don't i i think if it has adornment if it's engraved it needs to be very well done uh but i've seen plain finished purdies i've seen plain finished bosses um they were made as best quality guns i've seen holland royals without any engraving on them um so it doesn't have to be – in my mind, the gun doesn't have to have uh, a lot of embellishing. But whatever is there, it needs to be top quality. So if you 
put it on, make sure it's really well done. If you're not going to put it on, then I think I think those the guns I've seen that didn't have any finishing on them, didn't have any engraving and stuff on them, I think those guns are actually harder to make because yeah. um, there's no place for any uh, – the metal has to be – your metal work has to be so finely finished because uh, there's no place to hide. Mm-hmm. Um, Very so I true. Think, I think – there's no greater option to see nowadays. I think the only thing we can relate to would be like the Beretta SL3 mirror polished is 15 grand more expensive than the engraved one. Right. That, great point. Yeah, exactly. Because it's a lot more work to get it right. Um, yeah, yeah. I'm so. currently working on a, a gun for a customer of ours and we he, he wanted to get a custom engraving job done and about halfway through, well, t- sort of taking it apart, planning out the engraving for it, we decided, we... Um, that he would like it to be mirror polished. And he was shocked that it was going to cost more to get it mirror polished than it was to have it engraved. But luckily he's gone for it because I, I do think, like you say, it's it's a dedication to a very different art and the art of perfect engineering. Hmm. Interesting. So here's here's another um, question. How much does the, the overall styling of a shotgun um, affect its ability to be a best gun? So maybe an example of that would be when I close my eyes and, and try to dream up, you know, the, the silhouette of a best gun, it's a Holland and Holland Royal. It's an, it's a, it's a side by side with an English stock, um, a, a splinter forend. Um, it never has a pistol grip. It never has a beaver tail forend. How much does that just classic styling play into, um, a gun's ability to be kind of known as a best shotgun? Uh, for me, it's not. I don't. I don't believe that. I mean, I I have a a Boss Pigeon gun that has a round knob grip on it. That's how it was made, and uh, it's certainly, you know, it's a best gun by. It, it's a best gun, and it's a best that's better than a lot of other bests. So, uh, it's a side by side. Um, so Lucky I don't. Boy. For me, that doesn't. It, it, sorry again. As long as it's all done really well, that's my. That's sort of my thing. So. I suppose I'm a bit with Greg, like you said earlier, I think there's probably two sides to a best gun. I feel like if we're talking about best gun in the traditional sense of the word, you're right. It should be from when the phrase came to be, and that would be a side lock ejector built best part of 100, if not more, years ago. And that's obviously what we think of as the case. However, nowadays, I think best gun has to mean perhaps something else. And I think there has to be room for things like, I mean, a Cosme, for example, probably doesn't make you think of best gun. But a Cosme definitely deserves to be a best gun. They are the pinnacle of the art of a semi-automatic shotgun. I think. And they pass all tests of being perfectly finished internally, externally, beautifully adorned. The sort of thing that you would be very, very proud to own. Not that I want a Cosme in particular. Uh and I mean, there's a, li- a litany of Italian over and under makers who probably fall into the same category of making best guns, but perhaps don't get that title because the title is stuck with guns that were designed a hundred years ago. Like, do you? Yeah, there you go. Sorry, I'll stop talking. Okay, then. So on to our main question, uh, the, the the reason for this discussion. How does the best that America has produced stack up to the bona fide best English shotguns? If we, if we really cut away all the budget built and the utilitarian and the rock hard shotguns that were built with no regard to pointability or balance, if we just focused on the best, where do we stack up? Um, I took a look uh, quickly this morning at Guns International um, and, and found a $60,000 Parker A1 Special. And there was a $30,000 Fox uh, high grade Fox. And, and there's even $120,000 LC Smith deluxe. Can these be considered best guns? Um, are they on par with the best that's come out of London? So I suppose I'm probably not qualified to talk about the best of the best American guns. And in the nicest possible way, it's because not many of them get over here. So Greg, you're probably more qualified on this. How do they <laughs> compare? Well, so I, I, uh, <sighs> I don't think that the American guns. So I guess I guess it's. I'm trying. I'm trying not to get myself in trouble. Um, Go for it. So it's the, great the fun. best British stuff is better than the best American stuff. It just is. 
and you can't. There's no comparison. Now, is it... sorry, John, I'm going to cut you off. No, no, sorry, I, I was being rude and asking a question halfway through a sentence. I was going to say, is that because even their best stuff is tainted by that utilitarian need that people kind of apply to guns over over there versus over here? No, I think it's because the designs. It, it starts with the the basic designs themselves. Um, aren't as good. Um, so I think a lot of the, so the majority of the American guns other than the LC Smiths are all kind of, uh, variations on box locks, you know, and other than, so the LC Smith and the Lefevers, uh, those are kind of, LC Smith was a side lock and Lefevers kind of like a weird platypus of a gun. But I have always thought that like your Parker's, and your foxes and your Ithacas, those were basically, in my mind, there the, there were always ways to get around the Anson and Dealey patents that Wesley Richards had filed in the United States initially. You know, I know that I think maybe by the time Fox was around, I, the, those pa- patents had probably expired. And I always thought Fox kind of a fox is kind of a knockoff of a greener. But basically, the designs themselves, I don't think they are um, as well designed as a Anson and Dealey box lock. Um, and an L.C. Smith sidelock certainly isn't anywhere near as good a design as a, um, you know, a Holland Royal or a Beasley or those designs. So just from the, the like from the get go, I don't I think it's difficult for them to uh, be at the same level of quality. You know, uh, does L.C. Same... Smith still exist in any capacity? I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. Does L.C. Smith still exist in any capacity? No, that company, they stopped building them in the 50s and then they came back a little while, I think in the 60s or 70s. But pretty much, you know, like most of the American makers, they were all done by World War II. You know, Winchester kept on with the Model 21 for a little while longer. Uh, But I also think, you know, it's also, um, and this is something you talked about in your, your video, which is a really good point, is that they're made for different audiences and they're also made um for different sort of uh, under different commercial circumstances you know like um parker probably made i don't know parker probably made 175,000 hammerless guns okay wow and that's most likely more hammerless guns than were have ever been built in london uh and to turn out that level of guns to be making that quantity of guns I think they had to come up with designs and building processes that uh, were probably faster and involved more machine work. That was just just to crank out the number of guns they needed to build, you know. Um, So I think that impacts the way those guns, the ultimate quality of those guns. So, yeah, I can I can believe that. I mean, we can obviously traits from that from the Birmingham trade over here, obviously not quite to that same scale, but not far off either. When you look at Greeners, Webley's and BSA, the amount of guns they were turning out, there's an obvious drop in quality, even in their side locks because they're building them quickly and to a price. And I think interestingly, those people, they still exist today. Those buying cheaper items expect it to be harder. They don't want to be paying for, maintenance fees like when you buy a holland and holland you expect to have it serviced every year when you buy a beretta you're going to use it until it breaks hmm. or at least that's certainly the way it is over here yeah. so greg i guess this is to you would would you then say that that those um those super high values and and, and prices that i just listed off i mean is that mainly due to collectability of those those vintage old guns uh, more than anything yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that's it's 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 sentimentality. Um, it's you know, it's how collectible their guns are. I mean, the, and it's Americana. You know, people just people just like them. You know, look at what Colt pistols go for. I mean, Colt pistols are crude, machine-made guns. Um, <clears throat> but you know, it's not uncommon for them to sell for more than a hundred thousand uh, wow. dollars. And that's not because of the quality of the pistol. It's because of all the romance and the nostalgia, everything that's tied to it. And it's the same thing with the Parkers and all those. I mean, they are for what you, I guess, you know, it's like, uh, it's just, uh, the collectible world isn't, uh, it's about much more just, um, 
actual value. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's about something. It's about crazy things like those L.C. Smiths that are that much money. I just you can buy a really nice gun for one hundred twenty thousand dollars. <laughs> you could buy a lot of really nice guns yeah. for one hundred twenty thousand know, dollars. I mean, come on, I mean, I yeah, I mean, I you wouldn't catch me buying one, but you know, but people like them, and if you got the dough, go for it. <laughs> yeah. Greg, I think I saw on. Um your site, maybe a blog that, that you had written where you, you actually um, got to spend some time with and, and handle the, the Parker uh, Invincible and, and, and maybe even left um, that experience a little bit underwhelmed maybe, or, or um, uh, is that, is that right? Yeah. I've seen all three. I've seen all three of them um, and I've handled them uh, and they're nothing and they're nothing. So what's what's so impressive about those guns is just you realize sort of the history and how rare they are. Um, but if you want to just get down to talking quality, they're not they're nothing. They're nothing. You are spoiled, special. though. I think it's probably fair to say shooting a boss live pigeon gun. You are very spoiled. <laughs> Everything is going to look really average after you've played with that every day. Well, I mean, there, there's that's. Uh, that's true, but and the other thing too. I mean, and I don't want to sound like a, I don't want to sound like a jerk, but I've seen a lot of guns, you know, like you know, and uh, yeah, so those guns are very not they're they're special. cool, they're interesting, but I mean, there's just simply no way that they're on par with a really nice Purdy or the finishing just isn't there. And but at the same time, I don't like the majority of Parkers weren't invincibles. They weren't that end of the they weren't that end of the the market. They were. Uh, further, they were less expensive than that, and I think American guns are great, and they obviously they've stood the test of time. Look at the number of Parkers that are uh, the number of Foxes. Those guns have been used. Um, guys are still enjoying them. They're still hunting with them, so they're good for what they were. But it's a little, you know, it's like you can't compare. I can't, I, I can't take my F one fifty pickup truck and compare it to a Bentley, you know, and come out ahead. It's just not going to work, you know. Well, and I wouldn't you have to go off road. Right, I wouldn't expect it to either. You know, that's the thing. Like, I like American guns. It's just I also know that. Uh, so there, there's an auction. I used to go up to an auction in in Maine all the time, and they had a they have this room where they had all the guns. And one side of the wall they had purdies and stuff. Um, and as you went around the went around the room, the other side of the wall, you hit the foxes. So you could kind of the quality, like you'd you'd be handling these purdies and stuff, and you could just see them, the, how elegant they were uh, in these racks on the walls. And then you get around the corner, and you'd see the foxes, and you'd be like, "What the heck is that?" <laughs> and it was just, you know, it's it's just some ways it's not a fair comparison. They were, I'm sure, the people that were building these guns like the the people who designed them and built them were well aware of what they were doing they weren't saying we're trying to build a gun on par with a purdy because they didn't have uh they weren't going for that price point they didn't have that market in the u.s and there's something you know johnny talked about this in the video about there's very different audiences too yeah um that these makers are trying to appeal to yeah i've only honestly relatively recently gotten my first real hands-on experience with um with a british you know better or best uh shotgun and and really until you until you actually experience that and then you hold them in your hand and you put them to your shoulder it's really hard to describe and it and it's really hard to get um they they really are kind of greater than the sum of their individual parts um at that point it's um in the words of Simon Reinhold, it is easier to achieve flow state with the best gun. You have to work a little bit harder to get there with something less nice. And I think that is very true. When you pick up a good gun, it just does what it's supposed to do. You're not having to tell it to do much. And I know it probably sounds ridiculous, but like I said, you need to get behind it and pull the trigger a few times to go, yeah, that is tangibly a better thing. It's not exponentially better as the price point may dictate but I don't care. It's beautiful and I want them. Right. You know, I was at a, uh, so a couple years ago, like a couple years, maybe last year, um, I shot that new um, Purdy 12 gauge, uh, the trigger plate OU. What, um, the Perigenium Vicini one or the one that's actually made in London? The one made in London. 
the drop the trigger the dropout trigger group one. Very um, nice. I shot that gun quite a bit. Well, no, I, mean, I I I spent an afternoon with uh, the gentleman from Purdy's. I forget his name now at uh, Griffin and Howe shooting that gun and shooting some other Purdy's also. Uh, but the one thing about that gun that really shocked me <clears throat> was when he handed it to me. Uh, it didn't. So it's a big, heavy gun. That's a you know, it's a big, heavy like target uh, gun, and it doesn't feel like it. He handed it to me, and I was surprised. Uh, I thought it weighed a, a pound less than it really did. And then when you got it out and actually shot it, it still felt it had a, it just had a dynamic feel to it. And then um, I was at a shoot another time and I was shooting some, uh, some Italian over and under some, some of the newer stuff uh, that's, uh, that's much different price point. And those guns never, they felt heavier than they really were. And they also never like they never achieved that dynamic feel when I was out using them. They always just felt uh, they just felt a little sluggish. So I can see like I could I could feel the difference uh, in that Purdy and these other guns, um, and I could see why you know that Purdy is I don't know it's like a hundred thousand uh, dollars. Yeah, I know the new it, one's sixty five thousand pounds, isn't it? Yeah, start, like, start, yeah, starting, so. starting, starting. So then, why is that purdy such a hard thing to duplicate? I mean, there are other skilled craftsmen out there, and um, proven designs are known, and ideal dimensions have been noted. How does Holland and Holland or Boss or Purdy? How do they get it right every single time? I mean, what? Why is it so hard for others to replicate that? It's definitely a sum of its parts. I think a lot of other makers. So, so stumble into that same feeling by accident so there are certain Berettas and Brownings for reasonable money that you can go and get that will feel 95% of the way there however they have to be specced correctly to do it the Purdy is built from the ground up to feel that way it's very intentional and I think accidental and intentional are obviously two very different things yeah I would agree with that and I think I've been told too that it has a lot to do uh, with the way the barrels are filed up, you know, and basically where metal is left and where metal is taken from. Um, and in the less expensive guns, they don't have, uh, you know, to keep your price points down, you can't pay that amount of attention to the way the barrels are constructed. And so that, so they don't. Um, and it also, I think a lot of like, uh, I don't know that target shooters really, uh, uh, I don't know that they are looking for the same qualities in a gun that a bird shooter is looking for, at least, you know, cause plenty of guys shoot, uh, I I've picked up plenty of guns that guys shoot really, really well target guns that to me feel like, you know, a big lead pipe, uh, and they do great with them and they love them. So I, you know, and I've been told that some of the, some of the Italian guns come from more of a back, a background that, uh, is more of a target gun. You know, they don't have as much of a game gun tradition. Um, no, they're, they're trap shooters. Definitely. When it comes to their over and unders, a lot of Italian sort of, well, the modern sporter is a trap gun from 25 years ago by any, by all accounts, isn't it? So they always do feel that way. However, and I'm sure you probably have every time I've picked up a gun, of an actual champion, someone who's won decent competitions, those people, their guns feel, you get into that, they feel great. They do feel great. And whether that's because, to be honest, most pro artsies and Krieg offs, the, the guns that win competitions feel good anyway, but there's something about the way the champions spec their guns. No, or not. Even if they are a 32 inch drain pipe, they feel great in the shooting. There's no hard work there. Like for example, if you were to pick up your, standard browning trap 32 inch 525 satori that gun is going to feel like hard work to shoot having shot uh, quite a few of them technically and on paper and this is obviously where the sales part comes in is it's the same as a, a b25 32 inch custom build but it's not and like you say it's because of the way the weight is in the barrels because of the way the stock is filed because of the way the person building the stock actually picked it up 1500 times during the making and went yeah that's spot on or no that needs a little bit more 
to leads you to the point when you pick it up it has life it has character it has the energy of all the craftsmen put into it i mean it's probably a little bit hippie um but i genuinely believe that is the case like you can feel the passion and love come out of a best gun and you don't feel that with a gun that's just being made by a machine yeah that's a great point okay so let's start to put a bow on this um i'm gonna go on record as saying that i agreed with the video when i watched it uh greg sorry but i'm gonna put you on the spot where where do you stand no 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 i don't i i agree with them yeah absolutely i mean i i don't think you can uh the american guns they just don't they're not at the same level but i think it's a more it, i think it's i think people take uh you know umbrage to this idea like it's it's snobbery or something like that it's just it's different uh they were created for different audiences and they were created for different in different for different worlds and in a lot of ways you know uh that's why they are the way they are not to say the americans didn't have the skill it's just more that they didn't have the audience um yeah there was no market for you know rich landowners buying guns to shoot multiple thousands of parts yeah i mean and the ones so so in the americans that did have that money they bought british guns you know, they, that's why the, I mean, there was already, if you were a bit, if you had a gun making company, why would you start building a gun on par with a Purdy, go through all that stuff to set it up and do it here in America when someone can just go buy a Purdy? I mean, Harrington and Richardson tried to do that. They tried to build a, they, they brought people over from Wesley Richards and they started building a, Anson and Dealey box, like a true Anson and Dealey box, like, and it's probably one of the best guns that was ever made in America, and it failed. Uh, they were very expensive, and uh, no one wanted one that said H and R on it. You know, they wanted ones. You know, back then they wanted Scots and Greeners and stuff like that. But hmm. okay, so I've got one last question um, for the guys like me that like to buy and collect. Seeing as how World War II was so devastating on the English gun industry both from the standpoint of the skilled craftsmen who died in battle and, and the actual bombed out losses of some of the facilities. Are there any other, what maybe would have been or almost were best makers? Uh, Greg, I think you mentioned green maybe a little bit ago. Easy green. Yeah. Yeah. Are there potentially diamonds in the rough that guys like me can keep an eye out for and hope to have a better chance to afford? Uh, yes yeah yes is the, the short answer the the list is vast and uh, i suppose the, you don't really know until you've seen it in the flesh that's the hardest thing about it and been lucky enough over the last year and a half to build a good relationship with holtz auctioneers and spend a huge amount of time there perusing their collection and every auction i find a new maker or pick up a gun and go wow fall in love with it and then go, I've never heard of this maker before. I mean, the last one was, a, I think, a Jane McCrick, a nice Scottish maker. Never heard of him before. This gun was, I mean, it's not on par with a, a Purdy or a Holland or a Boss. But I tell you what, it's probably 80 or 90% of the way there. It felt great. It looked great. There was very little I could pick holes in. And it was 700, 800 pounds for a side lock ejector. That, to be fair, most laymen would look at and go, you could tell them it was a Holland and Holland. They probably wouldn't care or know the difference. And you're there. You're, you're most of the way there for... It's pennies. Let's, let's put it bluntly. That's pennies for a gun that was built by hand by artists, craftsmen, you know, legends in some parts. However, I've got no magical name <laughs> to give anybody to say, go and check yeah. it out because... Oh. <laughs> well, shoot. I, I actually had Guns International uh, dialed up and was ready to, to buy a few sleepers on your recommendation there. So, well, guys, you have anything to add to the conversation today? Um, any any final points? Well, so one thing I just continue and continuing on that thought. So one thing about there. So there's all these guys out there who all they're all think they're going to. I agree completely that there's a lot of great guns out there that don't have those high quality names on them. But in order to find those, you have to know what you're looking for. So that's that's the thing. That's it's tough to find those things. The other thing that's always that's something to always consider is that uh, everybody wants a Purdy, everybody wants a Holland, everyone wants a <laughs> so. I just know people who've bought stuff and then they, they they get these lesser known guns 
uh, and they can be hard to sell if you ever want to get something else. So you kind of work yourself into a corner, you know. You so. Uh, I, I yeah, I think you're very right there. That as much as it's an 800 pound gun that looks and feels like a 10 grand gun, sort of, it, it's not and never will be. Yeah, yeah and so I'm. However, tier. Sorry, go ahead. So I was going to say, however, it's like those tier two makers, although I would call someone like Stephen Grant is very much a tier one maker, you can pick up at tier two money, you know, a quarter of the price of an equivalent Purdy Boss Holland, and it is every bit as good, sort of. Or Woodward, for example, you can pick up for probably a bit more money, but they're not the same price as the big ones because they're, it's not a household name like Purdy's. I, I do have a final question, if I'm allowed one, for, for you guys. So, I mean, there's obviously over here, we've got a lot of artisan makers. We've still got all the big names kicking around, or the majority of the big names kicking around. The only sort of two companies that I'm familiar with that make modern, I mean, I could be way off here, good quality shotguns would be Kolar and Connecticut Shotgun Manufacturing Company, I believe. Um, is that correct are those guns good do you guys rate those guns is there still small makers that make sort of a couple of guns a year that are exceptional quality or is that not a thing over there yeah yeah absolutely um i've never personally owned a kohler uh but i've shot with plenty of guys who wouldn't own anything but um in regards to connecticut shotgun manufacturing i'm actually a huge huge fan i think right now i own five or six of their models and i'm just wildly happy with each one um, one of the things that I like best about what they're doing is how they're offering models that are sort of American made homages to some of the best designed shotguns of all time. Um, the A10, for example, is, is kind of influenced by the, the legendary Beretta SOs and their Inverness model, um, gets, gets pretty close to a Scottish David Mackay Brown round action. So they, they make experiencing some of these just legendary, uh, shotgun designs, you know, more of a possibility to, to, to hunters like me, Greg, what do you, what do you think? Yeah, I think those, I like all the Connecticut shotgun, uh, products, you know, I like the RBLs. I like the A10s. Uh, I think those are really nice guns for the money. Um, I have a, uh, I've shot the RBLs and I've always was impressed with them when they came out. I've always really liked them. Um, a friend of mine shoots an A10, I think it's a 20 gauge uh and it's a nice gun you know he for uh for the money it handles well it's well made well put together i have never seen a kolar you know it's kind of funny you mentioned that uh i've never seen one i mean I, and i don't know if it's just that you know i think they're out west i think they're more in the central part of america and i don't know if they're more popular out there but i've never seen one out here at all uh yeah in so. in, in my more serious clays and skeet days um if you were serious or even wanted to look like you were you either shot a krig off a parazzi or a or a kohler um a few of the guys i shot with went up to the factory in wisconsin for their own version of kind of the parazzi experience um getting to design their new their new kohler um i think they're just a modified boss action like a parazzi yeah uh, they're really well done uh, just kind of the same that same idea but they don't make anything sort of their own original uh -uh. no no. Actually, you should also look into the Galazan shotguns that are offered by Connecticut Shotgun Manufacturing, um, which are, I believe, completely hand-built guns. Um, they, they look to be on another level in regards to their, their quality and, and build and, and are absolutely on a kind of in another stratosphere when it comes to price. Yeah, but they're, the, they're your standard London, London pattern guns, though. And there's nothing – and the RBLs are – the RBLs are kind of unique, uh, but I think they're – you know, they're a – I think they're they're an Anson and Dealey box lock, basically. Um, so I guess they're not unique. But uh, there is one guy. So I don't know. There, there's a guy, a friend of mine, that I'm always trying to get plug. His name's Dewey Vicnair. And he's a uh, he's sort of a mechanical genius gun maker that lives in Pennsylvania. And I'll send you guys. So he's he builds guns from start to finish. He does everything. He builds the barrels, he stocks them, and he doesn't use CNC equipment. He's sort of building guns like they did in the 19th century, 
but he does every aspect of building them. And um, they're very unique. And he has sort of his own spins on side lock and how he constructs it. Uh, but they're beautifully made. Uh, I was just I was just looking at his site the other day, and uh, it's just incredible the stuff he's doing. And the fact that he's, again, building these things from scratch entirely by himself uh, blows me away. And I think, honestly, I think he's probably making some of the best guns that have ever been made in America. It's just he doesn't do very many of them. It's obviously it's a very time-consuming process, and uh, he's only concerned with making things the absolute best they can be. I mean, even more so, I think, than like your London makers were. He's really, uh, there is absolutely, he won't do anything unless it's the absolute perfect design. He refines designs. It's, it's incredible. But anyway, Dewey Vicnair. I'm always trying to get, I'm always trying to plug him because he's one of those people that should, uh, he should get a lot of business for what he does. So. Perfect. Well, I think we'll get wrapped up on that note. Uh, guys, I want to thank you both for making some time and for the great discussion today. Thank you very much. I really appreciate the opportunity. Take care, guys. Bye-bye. Cheers. So, have you made up your mind? Where do you stand? I'd love to hear from you with any questions or feedback at abreakintheaction at gmail.com. Make sure you subscribe to our podcast for more great shotgun-related content and follow us on Facebook and Instagram. 